I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, part of the 90 Min Football Network. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu, and I'm delighted to be joined by Mike Stavrou for this very special edition of the show. Mike, how are you doing, mate? Yeah, I'm uh, good. I'm very excited to talk about this. It's not very often we get to to do like really... Well, that sounds horrible. I was going to say it's, it's <laughs> really cool stuff. It's not <laughs> really cool stuff on Chronicles really of Aguna. Cool no, I was going to, I was going to say uh, this is the reason I love coming on this show um because we get to do cool stuff like this um and this is this is one of the one of the highlights so yeah I'm looking forward to it brilliant stuff <laughs> so uh, in case you hadn't already noticed by the title and by the thumbnail uh, we're going to be breaking down a very special interview given by Granite Xhaka to our good friends over at the Players Tribune as always their content is top top notch the very best in the business and um, this is another fantastic piece of work and from an Arsenal perspective this is one that we've got a lot of interest in because uh, Granit Xhaka has been a, a love-hate figure uh, amongst the Arsenal fan base pretty much ever since he arrived at the club Mike it's he's mm. one of those players who has divided opinion I've defended quite a lot because yeah. and I don't know about you but I think he's had quite a rough ride yeah, I mean, been a love-hate figure on Chronicles of Aguna because I don't know if you remember, but a few years ago, I think I was one of the guys that really, um, it never got to the point where, you know, I would I would abuse him because, you know, that's not what we do here. What we do is a balanced view, but I was definitely on the side of, um, you know, not really understanding what he was bringing to the team on the, on the side of really getting frustrated by his, uh, his disciplinary record and, and mistakes and, um, actually, what I have noticed over the last few years is that he really is so integral to the team. Um, and if anything, you notice uh, what he brings when he's actually out of the team and we have to do without him. So in, in particularly at the weekend is, is a good example, just showing you, you know, a lack of Xhaka in our midfield, how much we, we struggled. Um, so, yeah, obviously a divisive figure. There's, there's a um, sort of points where... Uh, his relationship with the with the fans has um, has been tumultuous to say the least, and yeah, I'm sure we'll get into all of those details on this episode. Indeed, and we're going to leave the link uh, to the interview and all the information that you need to find it uh, down in the description below. So please do check it out. We're not going to we're not going to go and break it down quote by quote because. We want you to watch the interview. We want to make sure that you get over uh, to the Players' Tribune Football. Check it all out because it is brilliant, brilliantly put together. But we are going to talk around the interview because there's a lot of things that I think will interest Arsenal fans within that piece. They'll interest uh, those who don't follow Arsenal as well. But I think in particular, as a fan base who's kind of watched the journey of Granit Xhaka since he arrived at the club, I think this gave us a really fascinating insight into mm -hmm. how he's wired um, his psyche, perhaps. I mean, I know what I took away from it, and and I'll come on to that in a minute. But Mike, just in terms of yourself, what did you take yeah. away from this piece? How has it impacted the way that you view or maybe perceive Granite Xhaka? I think it's really important with players, um, first and foremost, to to humanise them. And Xhaka talks about this a lot in the interview, and he's saying, you know, we're not just uh, players that go out there and paid a lot of money and it's, it's the sort of dream like there there is a story behind every player and you know there, there's a humor behind every player and I think as football fans we forget that quite a lot we see the money that they're on we see the status we have and we think oh like if I was earning that money just to play football it would be incredible and that gives people a bit of arrogance to to go on and then criticize them unfairly sometimes especially in Zaka's case uh, you know, very unfairly in in some scenarios of some fans. Um, and what it does, it, it what this interview, I think what it does is breaks down that barrier and he's able to directly talk to the fans and address them and and try and, you know, explain why why footballers are just humans and they're, and they're not these sort of godly beings that have are so lucky to to do this job but that that they that they, you know, need to be criticized and scrutinized at every single turn. And I think that's the great thing. And as you say as well, I think we get a bit of a personal insight into who he is as a person, 
into his background. He talks a lot about his dad as well, what a big influence he was on his career. He talks about his brother as well. So I think it really goes a long way to build that relationship between fan and player because what he mentions at, at the very beginning is that, you know, very rarely do we get to interact with the fans. It's it, You know, it feels very separate. It's very much yep. fan, supporter and player, not like they were in, in the old days, you know. You might go down to, to your local pub and, and you you might see your you know someone from the team you support like like my dad when he was when he was watching football in like in like the 70s and 80s he, he might go down to the to the pub his local pub and see bob wilson uh just having a drink and you say hello and but it's just football is nothing like that anymore they are sort of super rich uh super protected entities and there's just not that connection so there's no better way to rebuild that connection than to have an open dialogue and that's what this is yeah, absolutely. It is incredibly open. It's incredibly sort of in, insightful as well. And and I have to say, I really, really enjoyed watching it. And listen, I've, as I said, I've been someone and, and you know, Mike, who's who's been quite defensive of Granit Xhaka because I've always felt that he has an importance within this Arsenal team that perhaps by many has been overlooked. And I think what's really good about the timing of this interview is that it comes after a, I don't know, 12 month period where we've seen exactly the value of Granit Xhaka. I think Mikel Arteta's uh, sort of arrival at the club um, helped Granit Xhaka. And we'll talk a, a little bit about the relationship between the two uh, later on. But I think that for me, um, now that people are starting to realise and recognise how important he is, and as you said, the game at the weekend just highlighted that even further, take him out of the midfield, uh, particularly in Thomas Partey's absence, and we've got a real problem. So now that he's seen as the valuable player that he is, um, I think this was the right time, especially uh, to come out, sit down um, and and say your bit on it. I think understanding where he comes from, understanding his background, um, understanding some of the setbacks that he suffered in his career prior to Arsenal as well is really, really important in understanding the makeup of the man. Um, you know, he talks also in the interview about being committed to the club and, and the fact that he didn't just sign uh, that contract extension for a payday or to, to have a good time. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. But to me, I guess that was a little bit surprising because I, I'm not doubting his professionalism in any way, shape or form. I think he's always shown himself to be a model professional. But given we heard so many rumours last summer that he was going to leave and that Roma were his uh, destina intended destination, mm. I beg your pardon. And given that, we know he was almost out of the door following the Crystal Palace incident. Was you surprised to hear him talking so openly about his aspirations and goals at Arsenal Football Club? Um, yes and no, because we both sat here and thought, you know, clearly thought he was gone last summer um, because, you know, Roma were interested. There was talks of, of a fee, 15 million, I think Arsenal wanted. For whatever reason, that didn't happen and he stuck around. But it doesn't surprise me from him to hear that wherever he's contracted, he will be 100% committed. And he even said, you know, I want to achieve something here and I don't want to leave in, until I, I win something, essentially. And I just think that speaks to the professionalism of, of him. And you can never, you know, we, we talk a lot about responsibility and and, uh, and character on the pitch. And I, I don't think, no matter how many mistakes he makes, no matter how many fouls he gives away, red cards he gets, yellow cards he gets, you can never question his commitment to the course. And I think that's something that's evident in the interview. And one of the reasons why, if that move maybe didn't work out, he will put that to the back of his mind and say, I'm here to do a job. That move may not have worked out. I didn't end up going on two occasions, like you said. Um, and he's and he's here and he's and he's battling still. And even if you know he got into the last year of his contract, I, I don't think he'd be one of them players that would you know start to be looking elsewhere and disrespect the club and you know talk about it all the time in the media. I think he's a very sort of private person um, and he's a very loyal person. And uh, yeah, it's, it's it's good to hear, isn't it? Like from from one of your players that you know you are one hundred percent committed and. Even though players say that with Xhaka, like it's like he actually means it, whereas a lot of players will throw that out there as it's like a platitude. Xhaka, you know that he means it, which is good to hear. He talks about in the interview as as being perceived as a little bit arrogant sometimes, and as being perceived as someone who is a little bit full of himself. Maybe because he's quite, 
quite blunt in his demeanor because he's quite straight to the point, which I kind of like. But I think, as you said, this does break down barriers. And what that makes you realize is that you shouldn't take it personally. It is just granite Xhaka. And often, you know, I don't know about you, Mike, but in many walks of life, I've met people who my first impression of was not not great. And then I've kind yeah. of warmed to them and, and yeah. grew to like them after I sort of understood their character a little bit more. Has Granite Xhaka, in your opinion, made a mistake not doing something like this a little bit sooner? Or did the dust need to settle after that whole incident against Crystal Palace? Um, you know what? I think it could have been done a long, long time ago. Because, as you say, there has been that disconnect between Arsenal fans and Xhaka because he comes across as... I I'm not sure if cold is the right word, but... Whereas some players come in and instantly you you feel a connection like Aaron Ramsdale. Um, that, that's an example that I think is so clear to see. He was there a couple of months and already like you could just see him becoming like a cult hero. Um, you know, he, he leaves everything on the pitch. He's got he's got the banter about him. He's got the you know, he's he's in with the sort of Arsenal culture. Whereas Xhaka at times it feels like he's, he, he's not that person. And I understand that not every player is going to be like that. Some players are more reserved, but what could have helped bridge that gap and what's done it now is this interview because people understand his motivations and people understand why he does certain things that, that he does. So I think this could have been done way before in terms of addressing the, the sort of crystal palace incident. Yeah. I think that could have been done sooner as well, because what that did was damage a lot of fans relationship with him irreparably. And even though he has been playing well, you will still get people who despise Jacker and and will you know and still have that agenda because of what he did on on that day against Crystal Palace. So definitely could have been done sooner in terms of the incident, but also sooner, like way before. And as he as he said, which is an important point, like there needs to be that connection between the players and the club. Otherwise, it just feels soulless. And I feel like even though Arsenal have been pretty rubbish the last few games at least you feel connected to the team again, which is what Arteta's done and the players have done so well this season. I don't want to be that guy that keeps saying like, you know, I was always on his side because we're now doing a piece uh, around an interview that he's given. But I have been hugely defensive of Granite Xhaka and I, I copped a lot of heat actually after that Crystal Palace incident for saying, well, if you treat your player like that, what do you expect? Did watching the kind of the way that it was all put together in the piece, did watching those clips, listening to Granite Xhaka talk about it, did you did it make you feel in any type of way? I, I almost compare it to how I felt when I watched the Arsene Wenger Invincible film because mm. there was a part of me that was like a little bit cringe towards the way as a fan base we behaved and that made me feel a little bit sorry for the way that the wider fan base sort of acted and, and, and dealt with the situation. Did you feel that at all? Or did you feel any other type of way when watching yeah. that specific segment around the Palace incident? Well, I think as ever with things like that, with high emotion incidents, what what happens straight away when you watch something again, you, you almost relive how you felt the first time when it happened. And, and I was a bit different to you. I think when it happened straight away, of course, my, my overriding feeling straight away was, oh my God, how could he do that? You know, he's the captain. He's disrespecting the club. You know, he's the captain. You can't act like that way. You can't act like that to the fans, the the guys who, you know, w without us, you you know, there'll be no club, there'll be no players. And that was my overriding feeling. But once I sort of digested it and looked into it a bit more and, you know, understood from his point of view why he'd reached that boiling point because of the abuse, because of the hate, because of the, the constant, you know, criticism from Arsenal fans and particularly those fans in the stadium that day you sort of you, you did understand it more and you humanized it more so that's why it's so important Harry to do things like this because you people just understand more when you talk to them and explain it clearly and with a level headed in a high emotion you know uh, incident like that there, there's always going to be flared tempers and people are going to overreact and I could have ran with my sort of in initial reaction and been like, well, I'm done with Xhaka and, you know, Xhaka's dead to me and as as a as a footballer for Arsenal Football Club. But 
you know, once you, you, you have to process it, don't you? You have to go through the motions and, and look at every side, which is what, which is what we do on Chronicles of Aguna. We look at things from different angles. You don't just stick with one viewpoint and dismiss every other, which is an important way to be. That's why I slightly disagree with you, though, around whether it could have been done sooner. I feel like it need this situation needed time. Um, like the fact that he's been playing well and, and has improved in his sort of uh, outputs on the field and, and and all of that, I think, has obviously helped the situation. But I also think, as you said, in high emotion situations, sometimes you need to, to let the dust settle a little bit. And that would have been on both sides. I don't think Granit Xhaka would have spoken about this incident in the way he did in this interview, let's say six months ago, eight months ago, when it was still relatively fresh um, or, or fresher than it is today. I don't think that Arsenal fans um, would be mature enough to have taken it sort of closer to the incident, because I think what I would say is I know a lot of Arsenal fans and I hear from a lot of Arsenal fans in the chat box and in the Discord server who often tell me that over the last 12 months, they've grown to understand what it is that Granit Xhaka brings to the table and now have greater respect for him as a player and therefore they pay him more respect as a person off the back of him sort of lifting his level, being a key part in the team. But I just feel like had this been done 12 months ago, a lot of those people wouldn't be at that point yet. And so the reaction mm -hmm. to it would still be on the on the majority side of, of more sort of negative towards it. So I think it probably needed a bit of time to breathe. He talks in the interview about sort of some of the other things he went through in his career, the start to his career in Germany, which I'm not sure a lot of people would know was difficult. You know, he, he started off at Gladbach, but couldn't really get in the side after the first few games, wasn't even in the squad and, and spoke about quitting. Um, he talked about an ACL injury that he picked up at 15 years old. Yeah. And I know at 15 years old, you're probably physically in a really good spot to recover from it. But imagine mentally, because that would be, the start of your footballing career, really, wouldn't it? As a sort of yeah. moving into the adults. All right, adult is 18, but you're starting to move towards that point in your career. And yeah. then to suffer an injury like that must be difficult. You take those two things into account and you take into account the way he's bounced back from the Palace incident. It does say a lot about his fighting qualities, doesn't it? And that, for me, is an admirable thing. But at the same time, if you're going to be sort of complimentary of Granit Xhaka because he's a fighter and because he's bounced back from some of these situations. You then can't be overly critical when he fights back against an entire stadium getting up and basically throwing a ton of abuse at him when he's wearing our colours. So I think that, that there's a trade-off. If you want someone who's a fighter, you have to expect that there will be times where they will fight back. Um, and, and you can't, necessarily separate those two things because that's part of him it's part of his character this piece really kind of showed me that yeah 100 percent. and just going to that acl thing i mean as someone who suffered an acl injury myself and tried to um get myself back to you know a decent level of football and failed um i understand all too well how how difficult that is and the sort of grueling nature of it so for him to have experienced that you know on the precipice of becoming a professional football footballer at that age must have been extremely difficult to, to get over. And then, and, and um, he talks about um, after he'd sort of built himself back up and going into 50, 50 challenges. And, and he says that, you know, after my, my first 50, 50 challenge, where I, f I felt like I, I was stable and my knee was stable and I, and I, I came away with the ball um, and won the challenge. He was like, okay, that's it. I'm, I'm going in now 100% every time and you know that is for the for, for the good and the bad with Xhaka isn't it because he doesn't have a good disciplinary record um he's his career not even at Arsenal but at, at Gladbach in Germany has been tinged and and tainted in a way by you know his number of red cards but that doesn't seem to bother him it doesn't seem to to deter him and um you know that speaks to his character, it speaks to his uh, his sort of personality and and his temperament. He is that fiery character, um, and that is gonna that is gonna boil over at times. It is, and when you are in a position that he is defensive midfield and over, often having to cover in defence, you need to make those split second challenges. And what what I would say is the best defenders what they do is the that they assess the situation 
and they basically you know that the last resort is is to dive in what i like i always bring this up on chronicles of guna but i talk about maldini and he said you know as a defender you should never really have to tackle because you're in the right position you've got you know you, you can read the game well you know where the ball is probably going to end up virgil van dyke is a perfect example of that he doesn't go barreling into tackles he he reads situations and then he uses his body to sort of get def- get attackers out of the way and that is one the one thing about Xhaka that I would say holds him back. It's just that he can be rash and in in the Premier League because it's so fast and he's not necessarily the fastest player or most mobile player. More often than not, he's going to get caught out. So that is the one thing I would say, Harry, that listening to that interview and him sort of saying, you know, I'm not going to change and this is me and, you know, the, the amount of yellow cards and red cards don't really bother me, that, that doesn't sit well with me, to be honest. Yeah, that was the one part that I looked at, and I went. So I watched the whole thing like you, and I, and I was like, okay, I might not agree with every word you've said, but I respect it, and I get where you're coming from. And I'm not saying that I don't respect his view or his sort of the way he broke down that particular section, but I agree with you. It's it's not just when it comes to disciplinary issues, it's not just about you. It's about the team. It's about the collective and it's about the damage that you do to the team when you needlessly get yourself sent off. Um, and so I don't think that it's right to just be like, well, I, I don't care. I'll I'll just crack on with it um, and do as I please. So that was the one bit for me where I thought, mm, not really sure about this. But again, I think because I saw the beginning of it and that bit comes a little bit later on, I understand how he's wired and I understand the fact that he now is in a place where He's going to trust in his instincts because his instincts have got him to where he is. He's going to trust in his ability to fight through difficult moments and difficult situations. And so at the very least, I get it. But yeah, like you, yeah. that was the bit for me that I went, mm, not really sure about that. Because it's okay saying, you know, I'm going to go in and I'm going to make the challenge and and this and that. But you've got to think about how many times your your teammates have had to play with 10 men or the way it's mm. changed the, the or swung the pendulum in the other direction in certain game situations. So I think that's something where you need to be a little bit less selfish or an area where you need to be a little bit less selfish. But again, having understood and having listened to sort of the way he was brought up and the way his football career went. And the other thing that, you know, he was never believed in really, was he? He was told by his coaches that he wasn't going to make it, that sort of maybe playing in the second division in Switzerland was about his level and to be where he is today is obviously a testament to the the work and effort that he's put in. Just going back to, um, and I know we're jumping around a little bit here chronologically, but we're just kind of take going with the conversation wherever it takes us. Um, there was a, a little bit where he talked about or he highlighted some of the abuse that he had got. And he mm. talks a lot, doesn't he, about um, how people can criticise him. That's OK. But to criticise sort of his his wife, his children, um, his family, that is something that really um, gets to him. I think to me, I, I can relate to that. You know, not, I've never had it to the same level that Granit Jack has had it. And I, I probably never, in fact, I definitely never will. Um, but I've been in a situation where people on social media have disagreed with something I said about football and come at me and come at my family. And I, I understand why that really touches a nerve. So do you listening to that kind of get why that reaction came against Crystal Palace? Because let's be honest as well. And, and the bit that maybe he doesn't explain in the interview is that actually this was building for a few weeks prior. There was a couple of incidents. I was at Sheffield United away a few days before and he got booed off and, and there was ironic jeers when he was substituted in that game as well. So that mm. was building that whole thing. Um, yeah. given that we now know that a lot of that abuse was targeted towards his wife and his beautiful children, etc., do you now get it a little bit more? Do you understand it a bit more? Can you forgive it more? Yeah, yeah. And like, like I said, like I think it, even if a lot of fans' initial reaction to the Crystal Palace thing was, you know, get out of our club and how dare he disrespect the, the badge and everything like that, when you take a second to, to look at, the situation and scenario leading up to that moment you you do understand it a bit more and on the abuse I mean this is just typical of uh of football right now and it, it is a stain on the sport um it's you know social media 
anonymity and people who feel brave behind a keyboard and this is what Xhaka talks about you know that they are humans and at the end of the day say, say it to someone's face and I, I guarantee you 99% of the people sending those messages of vile abuse to, to him and his family would never even dream of saying something if if they met him face to face not not only Xhaka who's an intimidating person as it is but anyone, I don't think they'd, they'd even say it to Leon Britton. You know, no, no disrespect to Leon Britton, but he's not exactly an intimidating Leon person. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you see, he's just the first name that uh, that came to mind. But, you know, I think fans w- wouldn't even go up to someone like that because they don't have the balls. They they don't. They, these, are, these are trolls. And they don't have, you know, anything better to do than to sit online and, and hurl abuse at someone. And this is something we need to get rid of you know, as a as a sport and as you know, as society, because it, it spans a lot a lot wider than football. And um, yeah, one hundred percent, you understand his his motivations for doing that. You, you can never say that that it was right what he did, because at the end of the day, when you storm off like that, and when you, you know, you know whatever he said and said back to the fans, whatever you do, you can't you know fight fire with fire because it it just never works that way. And Both but obviously. Yeah, exactly. And he he just he'd had enough of being the bigger man and and he lost his call, which is understandable. Um, But I think we need to reach a place as a society, Harry, where we where we don't, you know, where we don't have these trolls and, you know, just just get them banned. Whenever you see someone doing something like that, it should be an instant ban. I don't understand why why people are allowed to have an, an honest account, abuse someone and then two minutes later, create a different account on a on a different email address. It's, it's not right. Their internet service providers should work with the social media companies to ban IP addresses and ban, you know, specific people when there should be harsher punishment. And what's fascinating to me as well is that when you, for example, you put a video on YouTube or, or you put something up on Instagram with a certain word in it pertaining to a virus that has been uh, doing the rounds over the last couple of years and as a lot of people have fallen victim to, the social media platforms seem to pick that up very quickly and then put a banner underneath your video which means that they can do it through automated means so the fact that they don't do it when it comes to abuse makes it even more baffling and 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 then you can understand why so much of that got through to granite jacker and why it really impacted him look we're going to take a very very short pause and then we're going to continue breaking down this fascinating granite jacker interview which you can find on the players tribune the links are in the description below make sure you check it out Welcome back to part two of the Chronicles of Aguna podcast with myself, Harry Simu, and of course, the main man, Mr. Michael Stavrou, breaking down Granite Xhaka's uh, exclusive interview with the Players' Tribune. It's a fascinating watch, a fascinating listen. Make sure you check it out. The links are all in the description. I just want to take it back to one sort of final part um, regarding the Crystal Palace uh, situation. What I found fascinating, Mike, was Granite Xhaka had an opportunity here to kind of say, you know, we've moved on, we're past it, um, you know, I'm f- fully focused on what I'm doing. It's almost refreshing that he didn't do that, though, that he kind of said, well, you know, I, I haven't forgotten about it. I still think about it sometimes. I am professional enough to get on with it and do my job. But he never made any secret of the fact that it still plays on his mind sometimes. He talked mm-hmm. about how he still remembers where some of the, the really prominent sort of abusers were in the stadium as he was walking down the tunnel. I, I find it refreshing almost. And then when I think about s- sort of sometimes how a character like that can get themselves into trouble by making maybe talking too much, you go to think, OK, you know, I, I want to have a go at you for this or or I, I think you've handled this wrong. But when you listen to the the rest of the interview, the bit before, the bit after, as I said right at the top, you just understand that that's him and you just got to get on with it. Yeah. But it, did, was you surprised that he didn't try and sort of put out the fire and say, you know, it's over, we've moved on from it, and that he was actually quite forefront about the fact that, yeah. no, it, I, I do still think about it, it is still on my mind. Well, you could see, like, when as soon as he started talking about it, it wasn't anything he brushed off. Like, he wanted to do it. He wanted to do the, the segment justice because it was such a big moment. And he said it was it was one of the hardest moments of his of his life, not even his career, his life. And, you know, that that tells you a lot what he went through at, at that time. So he wanted to 
speak open honestly about it. And one of the one of the most difficult things as a as a journalist, uh, as a football fan as well, is players being robotic and you know having so much media training that when they go into interviews, they just give the same old typical response. Um, don't give anything away. Don't show any personality. And one of the best things about the Players' Tribune is that it allows players to show a different side of their personality and to feel safe and in a position where they don't feel like the the publication is going to twist their words or or going to you know put a, put a clip out out of context. They're they're, they're going to give you it raw and and as it comes and as the player wants it. And that's what's great about this is that there's no punches pulled. There's no you know, dancing around the subject, he just, he gives it to you straight and you have to respect that. You have to, because if he came out and said, look, I really regret what I did. Um, I shouldn't have acted that way. Um, would you believe it? Because I, I wouldn't like you can, you can tell how much that hurt him. And he's explained the reasoning behind why he reacted like that. So if we're to go and do a U-turn and suddenly like pander to those fans or to, to, to pander to the fan base, just to win a few brownie points, that that would make him lose respect, and he's not going to do that because he he seems like a very proud man. So yeah. I was surprised in the sense that I wouldn't expect a lot of footballers to do what he did. But when it comes to Jack, as you say, that's that's just who he is, and you have to respect it. Yeah, hundred percent agree. Hundred percent agree. Um, he also went on to talk about the role that Mikel Arteta played in his staying at the football club. He mentions that you know after the Crystal Palace incident, for the first time ever, his father said to him, "You know, it's time to go." Um, his father had never encouraged him to quit anything before, but was very sort of clear that perhaps his time at Arsenal had come to an end. He talks about the fact that he had another offer on the table and that he was ready to go, but that Mikel Arteta. Um, and the way he handled the situation prompted a U-turn. Now, does that, we'll, we'll come on back to Xhaka in a minute, but does that speak volumes for Mikel Arteta as a boss? Because one of the common criticisms that is thrown at him from Arsenal fans who perhaps don't want to see mm. him continue in charge is that he's a really bad man manager and that he's a, he's a you know, he, he falls out with people all the time. Well, he doesn't feel like that is quite true when you listen to the way Granit Xhaka talks about him. It, does that show that if the player is of the right mindset, does sort of buy into Mikel Arteta, trust in him and does sort of adhere to his values, if you like, mm. that actually Granit, uh, actually, sorry, Mikel Arteta is very, very good at putting his arm around people and helping them through difficult moments? I think he helps people who want to be helped and who buy into what he's doing. And the the players that don't do that don't play and, and they don't get a second chance. So I think that's the, what been one of the main reasons behind our upturn. It's been players with, with the right character um, that have been able to employ his, his tactics and more importantly employ and sort of have the, the mentality that the, the manager requires of them on the pitch to go and go again, because football in, in this, in this day and age is brutal. You know, you, Luckily, we've been playing once a week, but usually it's twice a week. Um, you know, against all that harsh criticism and noise from outside, you need to have uh, a unified group. And you've only got to look over at Man United, Harry, and see what an absolute mess they are. Yeah, they might have a squad that's, you know, 10 times better than us on paper, but none of them are singing from the same hinge sheet. And it, it really shows uh, on and off the pitch what, what a mess they are. So the fact that Arteta w was able to you know, assemble this squad with Xhaka being a big part of that is, is is testament to him. And he might he might go on to fail as a as a manager at Arsenal and not live up to the to the you know hopes that we had or he had for himself. But I think the one thing you can say is that he's unified what was a very you know disenfranchised squad because I think we forget how bad it was under Unai Emery. Like there was, there was divisions. Um, there was players who didn't want to be there. Like you, you look at it, and, and Mesut Ozil was a, was a, was a big, big part of that team just before he arrived. And yeah, it didn't end maybe how we all wanted it to. And it was a bit, you know, sad to sit, sit go that way where he was frozen out of the team. But ultimately, that, that is what Arteta has been about and what he stood for. And a lot of people criticise him for it, like not giving William Saliba a chance, but. You have to trust the you have to trust the the man in charge, and I think you 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 trust him more when he gets results on the pitch, and that's just the way football goes. But in terms of just going back to Xhaka, I think 
you know, he is the sort of manager's dream. One really important thing that, that, you know, that he said was that, you know, if my disciplinary record is so rubbish and, you know, I'm such a liability, why do I play? And I think that's been the biggest question that we've all had as Arsenal fans. Why does he play every week under every manager? Um, you know, he played under Wenger every single game, basically Emery and now Arteta. And he basically said, because I train like I play. And, you know, clearly a lot of players don't do that. Um, and that's what gets him picked. So that for me was a bit of an eye opener. I don't, did you think that as well? Yeah, for sure. I, I, I've, I've always thought that he trained well, um, just based on, like you said, the fact that he plays every single week. I mean, there's got to be something there, right, that managers respond to and managers like. And there's something with regards to the commitment levels that he shows that clearly makes managers feel like they can trust in him because it's not just been Granite Xhaka playing in a deep lying midfield position. He's been charged with being a left back of late. Um, and on a few occasions, oh, there's been that. times that oh, I know there's <laughs> been times where he's been asked to drop into a back three. Like he's obviously someone that the manager feels and previous managers have felt can do whatever's asked of him and can do it to a, ver uh, a fairly good level you know that you're never going to get a lack of effort from Granite Xhaka, but kind of just um, one of the final bits I wanted to bring up around this interview was when he talks about being Arsenal captain and how difficult that that role is and that players here, and I don't know if he meant here as in Arsenal or here in the Premier League, are afraid to make mistakes. Mm. That for me showed that we are putting or we do put as a fan base perhaps too much pressure on certain individuals. Certain individuals can get away with it. They can make a mistake here and there and everybody says, it's okay, it's fine, we move on. But there are others like Granite Xhaka who are in this territory where every time they make a mistake, it's highlighted and it's scrutinised. And, and I think, like, imagine how much that must weigh on you. Like, if you went to work every day fearing you were going to make a mistake, like, I go to work and I don't fear that I'm going to make a mistake. I, I certainly make them. But it isn't something that's in my thoughts and in my mind on my way in. So as a player, mm. that must affect you psychologically. And that fear of making mistakes, I'm, I'm sure that doesn't come from Mikel Arteta. I'm sure that didn't come from Unai Emery. And I'm sure that didn't come from Arsene Wenger. It comes from us as fans. And do we have a responsibility, having now heard that from the horse's mouth, mm. to not be forgiving of bad performances because we are fans of the club and we demand the very best but do we need to sometimes step back and think about the way in which we criticize players and their performances and the way in which we put those points across yeah absolutely and i think this is you know the most central theme of this interview and what we've been talking about here is is you know respecting these these players as the humans that they are with with you know living breathing with emotions with families just like us and you know when they leave the football pitch harry they they don't you know go out partying all night every night and you know what some fans think they do they go back to their their families they go back to their you know children and and pets and you know they they are i i guess me me and you and other journalists and people in the media are a bit privileged in the sense that we've met a lot of footballers and i think when you do that you sort of you know at the beginning it's like oh my god like that's uh so and so um, that's this legend or this person. I think they're sort of built up in our minds, as as I said like earlier, these like like godly beings. But actually, when you meet them, when you sit down with them, they are just humans and they are just people. So I think we have to be very careful. You know, um, our words carry weight. And even though you might be some anonymous troll with two followers on Twitter, and you tell Xhaka to to f off, that might be the one message that that he sees all night. But people don't think about that. They don't think about who's on the other side of the screen. They put these things out there and, you know, they think they're, they're entitled to say whatever they want. Um, but it's not it's, it's not right. It's not right, is it? And it's something we need to we need to move on from uh, as, as, as people and as fans. And yeah, and that's that's why we try and give a, a balanced opinion and not trying not trying to dig into people too much. We'll, we'll always be fair and we'll always be honest in, in our opinion, but it, it never goes too far. Yeah, and it shouldn't. It shouldn't because you're still talking about a fellow human being. You're still talking about somebody um, who has gone out there with the intention to do their best and to succeed. Um, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. You know, as I say, we've all made mistakes. And and I thought this was 
a, a really powerful piece in kind of, as I say, giving us an insight into Granite Xhaka, the man, the character, the person. Um, and I think that's probably why he wanted to do this as well, because I thought he was very open. And he, and at the, in the first few minutes of it, I thought, mm, it's a little bit, it comes across a little bit sort of stern and a little bit serious and that there's no sort of soft side to him and there is no human side. And as you said, it's, it came, you think, oh, here we go. We're going to get another one of those robotic player interviews where he won't say much and he can't say much because of the position he's currently in. But this isn't that. Um, you know, it, it, it is a bit blunt at times, but you soon learn seven, eight minutes into the video that that's just his character. And um, and it's fascinating to get that insight because now I know a little bit more about why he does what he does, understand it a little bit more. And I will think back to that interview when I criticise because I will try and get into sort of where it came from and understand it. And I think we're, we've done that quite a lot over the years, but I, I hope that it does that for sort of the wider Arsenal fan base because creating an environment where our own players are afraid to go out on the pitch from fear of making a mistake is not the environment in which they're going to succeed and, and achieve the maximum possible. It brings a nervousness, it brings an anxiety um, into a group of players whose job is to mm -hmm. go out on a football pitch and express themselves. So Do you I think, Harry, really sorry, just to say, because yeah. it, it's really it's really interesting what you say, because, um, you know, there's been a, a significant downturn in, in Arsenal's last two games. Um, and we know because we've seen them perform over the last few months that they are capable. They are more than capable of doing so. Yes, we've lost two integral players in the system, but didn't it look like, especially against Brighton, that those players were, were fearful because of what had happened in the week before? and because of what was at stake. And I think that's the number one thing. And I get so much, um, you know, abuse from from my mates um, who, you know, clearly despise Arsenal. And even Xhaka said in, in the interview, you know, when it's Arsenal, it's always a story. And that, you know, if a player is saying that, it's true. It's not just us Arsenal fans being delusional. It's true. Um, and yeah, it's always like, oh, like, we're waiting for Arsenal to go back to that weak mentality, that sort of you know pushover and it's just almost like they're anticipating for it to happen but my point is didn't that game just show that how much fear and how much you know mentality can can play a factor in a in a team's performance 100 percent, because people came away from the palace game saying oh that's it now the top four is over you increase the pressure and then you add to that that spurs uh, had got positive results as well. And what that just does is it, particularly on a young group of players, and we, we don't really talk enough about the significance of the role that somebody like Granit Xhaka has within that group because he is one of the senior figures. And there aren't many of them. You know, with the exception of Granit Xhaka, you've got Thomas Partey, Alexander Lacazette. The rest of them are in that 21 to 24 bracket, uh, in most cases, trying to kind of, push forward to that next step. And when you've got that anxiety and that fear in you and you haven't maybe experienced it and you don't know how to mentally cope with it and you don't know how to sort of sail through it, it can be a big problem. But you're absolutely right. There is no way that in a sport where you're asked to go out and express yourself, you can put, be at your maximum if you're fearful. And, and, you know, how many times over the years, Mike, have we seen young players burst onto the scene? And the first thing people say is he's brilliant because he's fearless. Exactly. Because he doesn't realise the pressure that he's under because he, ha he doesn't know it yet. He doesn't know the significance of what he's doing yet. Once you start to realise that and get to that, so that phase between being really young and so young that you're fearless and then getting to experience, that in-between bit is the hardest bit, I think, mentally as a footballer. And I think you're right. We we need to be behind the team. We need to support the team. We all knew that this team could lose football matches. I mean, I, I really struggle to understand why it's been seen as the biggest sort of collapse ever that Arsenal have lost a couple of games. I think we all knew that this was possible if we were really being honest with ourselves. So, yeah, I mean, hopefully we can pick it back up and hopefully we can push forward. But, yeah, brilliant uh, chat as always, Mike. Um, let people know how they can follow you on social media and keep up to date with your excellent work. Yeah, so it's um, at Mike underscore Stavrou on Twitter is probably the best place. Um, I will be making a sort of professional Instagram soon because I've been looking at Harry and thinking, 
all right, this guy's this guy's doing all right on all platforms, but I I don't know. I see Instagram as as a bit of a challenge as a, as, oh, as like a I'm, sort of I'm football not... content creator. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't do very well on Instagram. Like Instagram, I tend to post like personal stuff like more um mm. than work stuff. I just yeah, yeah. But yeah, give it a go, man. Yeah, it's good fun. You Keep can an eye my, out anyway. You can watch my barbecue videos on Instagram. It's probably about the best <laughs> thing I've got on there. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Uh, make sure you are subscribed to the channel. If you're new, make sure you hit the like button if you haven't done so already. And please, please do check out this fantastic, insightful interview with Granite Xhaka uh, put together brilliantly by the people over at the Players Tribune. Congratulations to them on a wonderful piece. The links are in the description. Make sure you check it out. Let us know what you think of it in the comments. Let them know what you think about it in the comments section as well. And we'll be back very, very soon with more Arsenal and football-related content. Until next time, take care. Goodbye. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon.